And hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Nick Lamparelli. Today, I am very fortunate to have Ben Van Roo, who is CEO of Yurts.ai, joining me. And this is the podcast about AI, built by AI. So we have someone who is building AI and someone who I think we can learn a lot from because uh, they are not an insurance professional, but they are a technologist who are who's building technology, who's going to help us. Ben, thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not a, an insurance professional, nor do, I, nor do I play one on TV, but, but I'm glad to be here. And you don't want to be one, trust no. me. No, well, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe <laughs> I'd, like to work, I'd like to work with many of them. So, so, <laughs> so there, there we go. Um, so, uh, Ben, um, I start off all of these with um, give you an opportunity to give a little bit of an elevator pitch. I think it's useful uh, to talk about who are who is Ben Van Roo. So, who are you? Give us give us a little bit of your background, and then segue into Yurts. Why Yurts? What problem are you trying to solve? Why does it exist? Yeah, well, you know the the who is Ben Van Roo. That's a that's a that's an hour long or, or several hour long podcast. We got plenty but, uh, of yeah, I'll go plenty of time, Ben. No. How much time so, do you have? <laughs> no. So really quickly about me, I studied computer science, applied mathematics, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and grew up there. Uh, I worked with the Rand Corporation, a, a nonprofit think tank, mm -hmm. for years, and uh, and the Department of Defense um, for for some time in my early career. Um, I have spent a lot of time sitting basically between technology and and enterprise and um, you know, I don't have any particular powers or superpowers, but but I I, I kind of tend to focus on what actually matters for people that are trying to do things versus the super hardcore academic research mm -hmm. um, that sometimes happens in our field. And so, um, so you know, with with Yurts and what we were thinking about and what I wanted to start with is as I've been working in in applied mathematics and artificial intelligence for a, a long time. Uh, within natural language processing for a, a better part of in and around and hiring and building things for about a decade. Um, and then, um, you know, I would say tracking the progress that's been in that space for a while um, and seeing a couple really big changes. Uh, obviously, everyone talks about ChatGPT and now, but, but I actually think a, a lot of the big steps that were made that kind of enabled where we are today were, were really around 2017 and 2018. Um, I was, uh, I ran most of go to market and, and a, a part of a business that was focused on NLP in the enterprise. And I saw the models progressing really quickly and becoming very good, both on the proprietary models, which mm -hmm. like the, the open AIs and others, but also in the open source. Um, and with all of the excitement and buzz in those early days, and now it's exploded now it's, you know, it. You know, I, I always kid around that like my mom knows what I do now, like because of ChatGPT. <laughs> um, the the thing that I I saw was that people weren't focusing enough on was uh, this idea that once you have a model and you want to kind of plug it into everything that you do in an enterprise, um, it's actually really hard. There's a ton of stuff that has to go into it and make mm -hmm. these things useful in enterprises. And um, I saw the progress that was being made and also what I thought was just a massive gap in um, software and a platform to help people use these tools uh, widespread in enterprises. And so, you know, as, as exciting as, as things are now and you can sit down and you can have you can help your kids with their homework and you can you can, you know, ask all these interesting questions and have you, you know, have it write a sonnet like Shakespeare and Tupac at the same time. Um, the, the, the reality is no one's really using this stuff in their day to day, especially the large language models. It's just starting to happen in enterprises because it's still really hard. And, and so, you know, we started the company, uh, started, was working on the idea of maybe a couple of years ago and then, uh, formed, um, early last spring, you know, before the, the crazy, er, the spring of 22, and before the crazy buzz of ChatGPT, and and what made us a little bit different is we focused purely on the biggest challenges uh, that we felt for bringing the, these platforms and these capabilities into enterprise. And so, um, you know, our, our earliest customers are are the most demanding secure customers that the world cares about, which is 
uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, areas mm -hmm. in the public sector um, that were really trying to understand and how to use these technologies, but needed to address all the problems that we focus on with, with yurts. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask just a quick non-AI question. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, could you describe what a yurt is just so they know where the name came from? Yeah, well, so that that's a that's a um, it's a good good question and one like why do you do you know there was a, a Mongolian waiter in Washington D.C. that got really excited when I pulled out my credit card once and it said yurts <laughs> on it. Um, the uh, there's kind of a couple plays on it. Uh, so one is actually there's a bunch of kind of nerdy mathematics around um, models and the shape of models in in different n dimensional spaces and it kind of looks like a dome. And so there's there's some stuff that we do that actually is related to some of the math um, that we were built upon. But a lot of what we were trying to think about was um, I view these models and these capabilities uh, as it relates to people and their careers as something, an enabler, a tool, something that can help you kind of get to your career and your your destination. And uh, you know, I live in Northern California. We hike a lot. And uh, I, I kind of like the idea of a flexible frame, flight frame, excuse me, framework and structure mm -hmm. that people could, could use with them. And uh, it's kind of an understated thing and a little bit cheeky, um, but it sticks with you. And so so we formed the company and we named it Yurts and, and uh, so far I'm sticking with it. Yeah. And, and I think that will help folks understand why it is that you chose the path that you chose, the problems, the problem set that you went after, it's that that flexible framework. So um, let's level set just a little bit. Can you, um, just for, for the sake of the audience, um, AI can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, it, we can get very, we could get very technical, but in, in its simplest way, how, how do you guys think uh, about defining AI? What is, what is the um, the guts or the spirit of the AI, the artificial intelligence that you you guys are building and problems you're trying to solve with it? Yeah, so um, you're right. A lot of people kind of use things in different ways, and then other groups of people get pretty frustrated, and like that's not AI, that's machine learning, and this is this is yeah. that. I, I think um, in in for us, a, a lot of what we do is. I think we, like we 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 call ourselves kind of a bridge between models and enterprises. And so the what when I think about artificial intelligence, it, it's it doesn't have to all be machine learning. It doesn't have to be large language models. There's a lot of classical problems, even in the insurance industry. What could be defined as AI or um, some of these models can be like fraud detection is a great example. It's been around forever. Um, and it, it's very effective. It usually works with structured data. So it's going to use little indicators across the board to help you detect, is this fraud, is this not? Um, on the far other end of the spectrum, you see this, you know, the buzz around generative AI. Um, that's primarily, well, and really in the, the language space, um, kind of we'll take the computer vision stuff aside for a second. But in the language space, that's really much more around creation, generation, and working with unstructured data, lots of text. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you can define AI as um, rules that can be uh, kind of encapsulated in, in, in machines that can help make certain decisions based on said rules. You can go much more hardcore into subdividing it into branches of machine learning, et cetera. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, and I think this audience is, um, you know, these tools are in general made to help people uh, do what they do, help potentially give information for decision processes, help with workflows from, you know, that you that are in this world kind of redundant things that you don't want to fill out um, that, you know, I think the part of the excitement uh, and a little bit of the hysteria has just been that now we can talk to something in a way that we're used to doing and not, you know, press a bunch of buttons or, or it's really kind of focused on developers where they have to kind of surface something. We can just type it in a prompt and ask a question and something comes back. And I, I think that, um, you know, the models that OpenAI had when they, when they launched ChatGPT, um, they were kind of around and people knew about this stuff, um, but it wasn't until we changed the interface. And so, you know, that's a really exciting part um, where I where I look at language and models and I look at AI 
is that we're just starting to really understand new ways that we can kind of engage with these models and, and ask it questions and have different experiences and get very, very different results. And so um, it is, uh, uh, there's a ton of hype that we can talk about and, and I think hysteria and a bunch of fluff that's not real. Um, but fundamentally, I, I, I think our lives are, are changing right in front of us, um, whether it's one year or two year or five years. And, um, and so I think people are right to be excited a little nervous, maybe a little scared and a little unsure where it's all going to go. Yeah. And, and I think, um, I think that's a really good segue. Um, my, my own emotions about AI have like dramatically changed from I, uh, first time I used chat GPT, I felt like it was, uh, whenever I did my first Google search, you know, and, you know, yeah. before that I would do a search on whatever search engine and the first 10 responses would be in Chinese. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I use Google and it's like the first, the first response, the first link mm -hmm. is the one that I was looking for. And I was like, I, I was a believer then. Chat GPT gave me the same sort of feeling. Um, difference being that over time I've gone from, oh my God, this thing is going to steal jobs to, well, this thing still has some maturing to do. Like it's still, there's still a lot of stuff. And um, I, the question I have for you is there's a race. You, you talked, you said hysteria. Um, it seems like AI is being put into everything. Everyone's racing to do it. Um, on a on a prior episode of this particular podcast, we um, I think we concluded that um, that particular technology we were using probably didn't have AI just because of, you know, in, in our mini scientific experiment, the results that we got kind of made us believe that there probably wasn't AI. You said the word fluff. Help our audience understand um how should they be thinking about the AI in terms of like, is there, is there AI? Like mm -hmm. what's, what's behind the scenes or do they just kind of rubber stamp, you know, rubber stamp something and put AI on it? How would they know that there's AI there and how do they know that it's connected to some sort of model or some sort of ability to actually facilitate, uh, as you said, decision making? It, it gets them to where it is they want to go. How yeah. should the typical person be thinking about the technology in that way? Okay, yeah. So there's there's a couple of important things that I think you, you touched on with the question. And in if I can back up a little little mm -hmm. bit, um you 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 mentioned your first search with Google. And I and I think this is like fundamentally one of the most important things people need to be grounded in. And it's exactly I'm I'm glad. I mean, we've never you and I have never discussed this, but I talk about that all the time. Um you know, in, in, and I, I compare it not to like old search engines, but I, talk, I compare it to like the, the library Dewey Decimal System. So, so maybe some of the younger audience members actually don't even know what that means or is. But the reality <laughs> you, is like, you, you so, might as well have just said rotary phone. Yeah. Yeah. It just ages <laughs> me, but that, that dates me. It's fine. Um, but, but it's say the, um, you can use the Dewey Decimal System at the library, but you're never going to do that. You have Google and it's there and it's there to stay, you know, or, or other search engines or whatever large language models and um, ChatGPT is a good one. There's there's a number of them and, and there are open source ones that that are phenomenal. There are um, it, and it's going to evolve, um, but like. It's not going to go away um, and we'll, we'll talk about the hype later, but like the, the, the world has just kind of opened or, or been exposed to finally that the, the Pandora's box, like we are not going to do things in general as a society in the same way that we did. 10 years ago because of this technology, it, just like search. And it's, it's a perfect, just like Microsoft, Microsoft Excel. Like there were, there were people that were doing fine accounting uh, measurements of crunching data in mm -hmm. large rooms for a long time. And that's, that's gone. And, and so, um, so to get to the, the latter part of your question, um, I would worry less about the phrasing of is this AI or not? I think what you're really kind of getting at is a degree of do I trust what this thing machine rule set um, is saying? How do I understand the quality of the results that are being produced? 
And what do I do with that? And so mm-hmm. this really kind of gets into, um, and I'm sorry if you know to, to not explicitly decide on on what is AI or not. The the the, the but I, I do believe that the core of what people are trying to get at is like, how do I work with this thing, and 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 how do I understand if I should trust it and and engage with the results in 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 one way versus another. Um, and I think that that's super important. And so, you know, like the world has never used hallucinate as much in the, you know, the vernacular in 2023, <laughs> um, you know, short of whatever those people that lived in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, it's just it's, it's hallucinations in this concept are, are are super real because we had this experience through chat prompt where you um, are asking something and it's very confidently answering with a very high level of fidelity of output or seemingly output. And 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 so this is where it kind of gets into the guts of why it's actually hard in enterprise. It's it, without going into the weirdness of the math, language models are very good at language. They're not necessarily very good at information retrieval. And so like parrots can say stuff, they don't actually know what they're saying, but they sound very confident. Um, but you don't necessarily want them to do certain types of activities. And so, um, and again, everyone's just kind of learning some of these things along the way. Um, and it, it, like the, the field has changed so mm-hmm. drastically in the last 18 months. I, I can't emphasize that enough. If you were living and breathing this stuff, it's like each week, you're like, wow, Two years ago, that would have been a major breakthrough. This week, it's just this week. And so, and so with your, your question around how can you, or fundamentally, how can I trust it? How can I engage with this thing? Um, in general, it, you can't in your enterprise workloads. Your insurance, you know, you work in insurance mm-hmm. and, and you can have it give you some suggestions on, hey, give me some ideas. I want to write a new policy policy on X. What are some good patterns to do that? Well, right now you can either, that'll be based on whatever's scraped on the internet, potentially in chat GPT or whatever the model was trained on until, you know, because, but that's all based on just a language model. Again, it's not really good at factual information, but it is going to probabilistically say word after word after word that kind of lines up against what a concept of a policy might be or some suggestions. But this is where, again, part of the things that we're trying to come when we built the company is then, okay, how do I actually connect this model with the information that's in your enterprise? Your your insurance company might have had one bajillion examples of policies that are like the one that you're now trying to craft. Um, And maybe you cut and paste them, but maybe you need something authentic. And uh, you can, there are other techniques to now grab your data that you have within your company or within your team or within on your on your drive, your Z drive or whatever, and connect it to uh, connect it to the models and then get a much, much more authentic and much more accurate experience. And so we're going back to the original question, whether it's AI or not doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is get the most accurate, authentic output for the tasks that you're creating. And and I think that that's that's um, that's that answers what I try my, to think about that this. answer that answers my question and that's a great segue to the next one because you have now mapped out my my emotions around it where I was like initially wow this is phenomenal and now I'm at a now that I'm several months in I'm at a spot where it's like oh I have to double check this yeah. thing all the time because you are correct like it sounds so convincing and i've uh, unfortunately released information um in my own blog posts that um y- y- you know i i have a wednesday uh wicked weather wednesday and mm. i asked and i worked with bard and chat gpt and it basically crafted an entire blog article and i said oh my god this is the best technology ever it's mm-hmm. writing the whole thing for me what events occurred in this past week historically and give me information and it did and then you find out later that it got the dates wrong yeah right it it right and and of course it would because i didn't tell it enough information i didn't tell it specifically what i was looking for around the dates what dates 
the date when the storm formed or the date when it made landfall. What are we, what are we talking about here? I didn't tell it enough. So now it, it made me a better prompter, but it also now I have to double check every little thing. And that's one of, one of the aspects that I think I would like you to talk about with yurts that I, I picked up with you when in our initial discussion was you had mentioned something about creating a um, an audit layer or a, or a check layer mm-hmm. around that. So uh, the, the companies that you're engaging with, you're not just like putting in some sort of AI layer and then just like, okay, go. You're you right. actually put in like a safety or a buffer or something that's basically checking the result. Mm-hmm. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm now a human, as a human, I'm manually doing that I have to check everything that ChatGPT yeah. is telling me and making sure did, did it get the dates right, you know, whatever, whatever the context is. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about how important that would be from an enterprise yeah. standpoint and how companies that are, as you said, they're going to be using this. So get used to it. But how can they get you? How can they get comfortable with the fact that it's not that information retrieval system that you talked about? And so other you have to dress it up in other ways to sort of protect the enterprise from what it is you're trying to do yeah yeah it's a it's a great question and and i think um there's a couple short answers and kind of go longer answer the, the idea of hallucinations and and what you feel and experience in the chat gpts and the bars today um across all models and even modeling plus this um I don't know, go into the science of it, but the, when you match information retrieval with modeling, it's not perfect, period. There, and there, there are different types of flaws, and you kind of touched on one that where this is still there. Um, no one's got it nailed right. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, we follow this every single day, and everyone's like getting better. So um, I would say, um, very briefly, I think in 12 to 18 months, it's going to be not solved. But there are going to, we're going to keep getting really dialed in on this as, as a community. And so there's a little bit of it that I'd say people play, try, experiment, or start to invest, understanding that this is not going to be a perfect um, solution for certain use cases and that you need to not trust certain things, especially right now. It's still beneficial. You can see it, it can help with certain areas, but don't assume that it's perfectly solved yet. Now, when you work at an enterprise, like to your point, and 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 what early my early days of starting the company when I was working on these tools, um, that hallucination problem, the fact that it just gets stuff wrong, um, I just couldn't trust it anymore. Like I'd go nuts because I was like, okay, cool, I crafted this thing for me. Now I've got to go and read every single fact. And so so what we focused a lot on um, was that. Um, was really like, okay, there's a bunch of really interesting, useful information that exists within an enterprise that can correct those facts of a model that has no context of your enterprise. There's no context of what your team is doing. You have all that data there. And so um, we focused on implementing a lot of those techniques very early, which are now becoming much more popular. If people are really into this, there's techniques called RAG, retrieval augmented generation that are kind of like best in class and they're, they're, they're good. And so what this does is so when you use, like if, if I were to deploy yurts into your environment and you want to generate a memo with past information, it's going to basically say, Hey, Nick, I'm going to be connected to all of that content that's relevant to the memo. And I'm going to pull out exact facts and citations associated with that memo. So, so what that does is it helps with the fact checking process. So it, it steers the model to not make nearly as many errors on the dates, the times, the people. If someone you know has changed roles in in in, um, in their job or, or or moved to a different location. Um, but that being said, like it's still not totally perfect yet. But what mm-hmm. we but what we do, and there are other companies that are, I, I think we're we're one of the ones that's pretty far along in this space is um, for enterprises is to be able to deploy this you know in your environment and allow you to engage with the machines this way because the, the, the and i'll kind of touch on this last part a big part of the problem is as soon as you say okay i want to use these cutting edge techniques where the models you know we use information retrieval and then we match it with the models 
cool until you're sending a bunch of your customers' data over the wall to some model, a third-party service. And that just like so many CIOs across the country, mm. um, they just like, it puts a bullet in the head of the idea right away because you can't do that. I mean, there's laws around that. There's a whole regulatory body. And so when we started Yurts, I mean, we fundamentally were like, okay, how do we how do we run in virtual private clouds? How do we run on bare metal data centers? I mean, we can run on very small form factors of just like a workstation with a GPU or two. And, and that was important to us because privacy and security came first. And so, um, so when you, if you want to try to take advantage of some of the most cutting edge techniques in this space, and you want to use your own data, it starts to open another box that says, oh no, how do we control who has access to this? How do we control uh, the rights around it? How do we make sure it's safe and secure? And, um, you know, again, I, I, for, you know, for good or for bad so far, for good, that's the type of thing that we focused on. Um, and, and so the, the customers that do have these high security considerations and concerns, um, you know, we, we were a good match for them in, in the regulated industries. And so you're, you're going to see this in healthcare, in banking, certainly in insurance, in the public sector, um, you know, where data matters the most. Um, and so, uh, it, it's, you know, it is a, it is an interesting next chapter in this journey of, of AI. Yeah. And, and, and one way to, to protect your data is to, um, apply the AI to your data and have only your team get access to it. And when I was researching yurts, I noticed, um, you posted a video of a new employee who was coming in and who was play um playing around with yurt's ai to to basically say like hey i'm curious as to whether these guys are eating their own cooking right like will yeah. how will this thing actually onboard me yeah. and um so it gets into what i think initially attracted me uh to the yurt story which is around knowledge management which is around mm -hmm. all of the information the wisdom the insights the structured and unstructured data that a company collects the the wisdom that might be walking out the door from mm -hmm. retirement and things like that. How do you capture all of that and make that all neatly available? Um, can you talk a little bit about yeah. um, your you know your decision to kind of focus on that particular use case? Because I think one, it's important because it 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 clearly defines like how how you guys think about security and other things. But I think a lot of folks um, underestimate the amount of knowledge and wisdom that's kind of there amorphously that they can't readily tap into. And, and the example would be like, I can't even tell you when I've really looked into it, how much time I've wasted just searching for things, Yeah. right? Documents yeah. or whatever. And like ours, like it, sure. it really is unproductive work. Can you talk about knowledge management, why you guys have, why you guys yeah. are going after that particular use case? Yeah, and and so you know, I think there's there's probably if uh, you, you know your your listeners are are, are still tuned in. Um, of course they are. The, the, uh, well, they got on. I'm going to listen to it on two two speed. I always everybody's got to got to see how it's on there. <laughs> but um, what you'll see in insurance, and then I'm going to come to knowledge management. What you're going to see in insurance is um, there will be a number of companies that will will continue to enter the space and say, hey. I can help on um, mm -hmm. next gen claims processing with right. Gen AI. And um, you know, there's a couple of questions you can ask, like, hey, is this a wrapper around Anthropic or ChatGPT? Or like, can I run this on my own private cloud? You can you can you can start to if I were if I were in that space and say, okay, well, do I really care about this this particular workflow? Is that the main one at the company that I care about? Um, and you know, you might end up wanting to buy a certain AI. What you might see at the same insurance company is, is everyone wants to now buy their own to do X. And so, um, what you might have is you're again, you're the CIO or the CISO and you have 15 different AIs that are all sending their data over to a certain place and like, okay, that, that's where things get a little bit unruly. So when, when we thought about those concerns of individual workflows, can we perfectly solve the claims processing question? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe there's some people with different widgets that are are better. Um, but what we got to with knowledge management was, wait a second, we're sitting on all of the data of the company. We have all the right access controls in place. Mm -hmm. um, 
what are people doing most of the time? You're searching for stuff, you're potentially chatting against it, and then you're creating something new. And so we just thought like, this is this is such a really nice universal way to allow everyone to have access to parts of kind of these next gen models, but by just way of making search internal enterprise search a lot better and and then putting used to it or you know putting it into a productive state and so we're knowledge management um it's amazing how bad enterprise search <laughs> has been like you go on slack if you're you know and you're like well, did i ask there or is it in my email or is it in a shared drive or yep and in and, and where we think a big part of what this great opportunity is is we can just punch out and connect your Oracle databases or your service now or your SharePoint sites and have it all or your whole world and ecosystem organized by one one group or one kind of search experience. Now where the language stuff kicks in and where the AI kicks in is again, now you can engage with it like you would a Google search and, and you can engage with it in a chat style format. And you can make yourself more productive. And so, you know, again, when we we talk about, and I've talked a little bit about like hysteria, and everyone's kind of all like crazy about, oh my gosh, the robots and Arnold Schwarzenegger are going to come and take over the world. A lot of people just want a better search experience. They just want to find their stuff and they want to do things with it. And and so like the, I try to walk some of the hysteria back, at least in in my job when we talk to people that are really concerned in this space and say, look, let's just we need to baseline where people are at and what they're trying to do each day. And and I think we can make things a little bit more productive. And so yeah, I mean we think a lot about just what are the right ways to organize this information so you and your team can say, okay, we have this repository of information. We call them knowledge collections. You can click into it, you have all the documents organized. And um, and then to your point, we think that there's a lot of different knowledge collections that can be used in lots of different ways. And so we made this capability where you can just stand up a chat bot on anything. And so PTO is the example. I think you said you, you saw that one. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's our PTO policy? And and what's our, you know, what's our what's our like time off? And and those things lived and died in Wikipedia's and in random disparate places. And everyone would get really frustrated around those basic activities like search. You just want to chat against that and you want to be hooked up in the right place. And so for enterprises, we spent a lot of time just basically building the capability to say, hey, you want a lightweight chatbot on a number of things, whether it's HR or your hardcore claims processing. Cool. We, we can help set that up either way. And, or at least allow that for your IT administrators to deploy those really quickly. Um, and so, you know, the the there is a last point. Your broader vision or question about um, how we're, you know, we would say dog fooding in our in our industry, um, using our own products on our own systems. Um, yeah, we we made a very specific decision to uh, live and breathe what we're doing, and so we're we've hooked our own technology into almost everything that we do. We're not transcribing every meeting, but we are some. So meeting transcriptions get summarized and logged. You can chat against, what did we talk about this week? What did we do for our product updates mm -hmm. this week? I haven't quite accomplished write me a quarterly board uh, you know, <laughs> note yet, but like that, that's my objective. Because if I've achieved that, if I can basically automate my, you know, who, the, of the little value that I add to the company, if I can help automate some of that process, um, we will, as a company, have felt the pain that companies we're working with will feel. There are other questions around, you know, what information can be shared and whatnot, and 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 how do we make sure that people can feel open and honest, and the machines aren't recording everything, and and um, you know, can the CEO ask questions of what happened in this group each week and what shifts there? And so we're just kind of living and breathing the experience, and that's like next gen knowledge management is going to feel very different because someone may have left the company and we didn't lose that person's contributions and brain and institutional knowledge in the same way that we do today. Yeah. And again, I think, I think people underestimate the power of search and how much time is unproductive. I think of not only startups that I've had, but others that I've consulted with, and you can have the best of intentions, but what invariably been, what ends up happening is you will hear the conversation where is this thing? Is it in text? 
Is it mm -hmm. in Slack? Is it an email? I've even been in companies where it's like I try to enforce we only use this tool to yeah. internally to go back and forth. There should be no dot. And, and invariably, you'll get an edge case or something where it'll end up in an email. It'll end up in a text message. Maybe there's an emergency. Yeah. And that now it's kind of it, it's uh, found its way in. It festers. And now you can't control it. Mm -hmm. anymore and that search things becomes extremely frustrating for anyone that's mm -hmm. trying to get anything done um but i think you're hitting i think in, you you hit on it like early on in this particular conversation you know what is the problem that ai solves yeah. right and i almost think like if you ask what's the what's the problem in the world that apple solves i think most people get it wrong you know what what they're actually solving what's that that abstract thing i think what you have really hit on it's that I, I believe in and I had not connected the dots. It's that it's the interface mm -hmm. element. It's the the ability for um we can we could have transcribed notes anytime we wanted to, sure. but that that would have required like a transcription, then you gotta store it somewhere, and then someone's gotta like go find it. So we got a search yeah. problem. Then someone's gotta read it. Then right. someone's gotta summarize it. No mm -hmm. way. Like you're there's no productivity benefit to doing all of those things but now you you said the ceo can just ask a question mm -hmm. what is going on with that group mm -hmm. and now you have a tool that can read all of that information read all of the summaries read all the transcripts and provide something that you know over time you can create business intelligence around like okay uh i didn't like the way it answered it the first time but i liked being able to ask the question and just getting a response back for you, like the board, right? Like there will yeah. be those technologies. Um, is that the problem AI is solving? Like our ability to interface with the mountains of data we have collected over our human existence that mm -hmm. uh, we have not been able to tap into even with the internet, even, the internet's yeah. making it worse, right? Even right. with search, that we're just accumulating more data with the inability to mine it and do stuff with it. Um, is from an abstract standpoint, is that the problem AI is? Ultimately? Well, I, I think that you know earlier when we talked about fraud already, right? So like the the algorithms and the models to help solve fraud, a lot of that stuff there were detection problems. One zero, you know, this is good, this is bad, knows their own structured data. Um, you know, language. Some of the language models, the early ones, were like, "Help me! I, you know, here's a here's a policy document. Pull the key people out of it, and and there's use in that because you'd want to or pull the key attributes of the document out of it, and some are, you know, maybe roll that up into something else. And that was, you know, useful in terms of just like baseline automation tasks and and even um, some uh, things, some kind of like baseline search. What what the Generative AI and large language models are, are, are helping with now um, when we talk about the interface is um, it gives us a much more broad set of capabilities to engage with historic information, um, textual, unstructured information and make sense of that world. And that mm -hmm. that's like that's kind of a big part of this, why it's different now. And, and, and it's it's certainly not perfect. Um, especially, I would argue, where structured and unstructured information all kind of have to engage. So sometimes, like your, to your point earlier, dates, that date's got to be perfect on that policy. Um, the, the, the new models are very, very good at the language sounding like you or sounding like the policy generation, but they may actually get that part wrong about the date. And so these things um, are, um, it, it's a much wider range of how um, we can address certain types of problems. And I think the part of the value of the language model is not only in that it can generate, but you can engage with it in this different type of interface that you're used to doing. Um, it, 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 it is going to be, um, I like that you use the word business intelligence. There are going to be new paradigms soon as we kind of dial in this ability to extract important like numbers. When we get that right, um, you don't necessarily need a Tableau dashboard or, you know, mm. some type of business report to come out because you can just ask it 
you know, I want revenue last month. Um, and these are newer interfaces of working with established systems and working with uh, these new kind of ideas and models. So I think it's really, um, it is exciting. Um, but, you know, I, I think that for for your listeners, you know, for the those that are at the larger insurance institutions and they're trying to formulate a strategy, um, I think go into it understanding a couple things. Um, no one's totally nailed it yet. Um, there are privacy, security, cost considerations, which we haven't even talked about on, you know, is this effective in what use cases and how is it going to really impact our workflows or impact our company? What are we, what kind of bill are we going to pay on the other side of that? Because um, the computing power used not just in training models, which people talk a lot about in inference, you know, that every time you ask it a question, it costs money. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of people are kind of struggling right now. So I'd say, you know, if you're a listener out there and you're, you know, at a major insurance company uh, or whatever, and you're trying to come up with a strategy, you are not alone. There are a lot of people that are just trying to get their heads around it. Um, and uh, I think for the people that in their day in day lives, you know, it's, again, really going to be more geared towards helping you accomplish certain types of tasks and workflows that you have today that are either mundane, they're very search heavy, they're very composition heavy, and those can change in the very near, you know, now and over the next, let's say six to 12 months, they're going to get, it's going to get pretty good. In the next two to four years, if it, we move at the pace that we're doing today, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. I don't know what kind of reports they're going to be writing in the future. It, it yeah. feels a little strange. Every, every time you think about like, what could we come up with? Like what's, and, and, and you're, you're talking about like the speed of advancement. And I've studied a little bit of the history of like what NVIDIA did and, and how like we, we converged into this point of time where, we now have this particular hysteria mm -hmm. and I still have not heard anyone talking about like quantum computing and what that could do. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I think that's where like a lot of the fear potentially comes in is like, we're going to lose control over this thing. I'd like to end the discussion talking about fear, mm -hmm. right? Like the roadmap that we're heading on, mm -hmm. um, is the thing that we have to fear fear itself or um you're you're a computer scientist um can this people are thinking of the terminator is this thing mm -hmm. gonna take on a life of its own because when i do start to think about the quantum computing aspect i start to feel like are we putting enough controls in this thing where it's um not gonna go haywire um how, how do you how do you yeah. discuss things around the potential future of this direction and people who are naturally nervous. Yeah. Geez, Nick, we're ending on a dark note. You know, people are going to, people are going to be, all right. They, well, so let's dive in real quick. So, um, I, uh, I certainly have moments where I think about something, uh, you know, and, and again, I, we work with the public sector and in, in, in Department of Energy, Department of Defense. So, you know, I, like I, I do think about like, okay, can, if, the jumps, how many leaps do we need to make? Um, and there are some really hard questions around if and when um, AGI, artificial general intelligence, is, is going to occur and what does that mean and the impact on society, whether it's jobs or national security or, you know, just the existence. Um, it, And then at the same time, like, it struggles to write a memo and give me any factual information about you know, that I asked for. So th there's, there's kind of like, I, I get it. Um, I, I think personally, um, I worry when I think about regulation and hysteria, um, I understand those kind of extreme use cases, extreme concerns. Um, it still feels pretty far off to me. You know, you bookend that with like, people just want better search some of the times. And, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I think what we're going to see Monday, so probably I don't know when the podcast is hitting, but um, this coming Monday, President's going to put out an executive order on AI regulation. And 
what you are likely to see. I haven't read the full bill, um, but there's going to be some recommendations around assessments. There's going to be recommendations about co companies trying to get their models assessed. And, um, and, and a lot of it's going to be really well intended and like totally fall on its face. And let me give you an example. There'll be an idea of like AI audits and that you, there's a New York law on it on auditing um, algorithms for bias and jobs. There's literally no audit industry for this. So this is not like a financial audit. There is no assessment. There's no people that are qualified to do it. There are people that haven't been trained to do it. So I think what's when I am skeptical about regulation, um, I think the, pol the discussions are good to have and think about those catastrophic fears. Um, but I think the like implementation in 2023 and 24, practically, it just doesn't mean anything. Either it's not going to have any teeth or it's going to be really cost expensive because every time everyone yeah. tweaks a model, they have to go and pay somebody to assess it. So every time like an insurance company, if you guys want to use an open source model and then what's called fine tune it, tweak it a little bit, um, you might have to have pay someone to go and review it. And that person doesn't necessarily have the quantity quantifiable skills because there is no industry or training around it. And so um, I, I think personally, um, I get the fears, but I think though those are a bit out. Um, you know, I'm not, there are, there are quantum computers and um, I understand that that is a little bit spooky as well when you overlay the two concepts together. Um, and this, this is going to be, I kind of feel like a lot of the, the, those are a bit off. And, and for the some of the hysterics around um, bias, um, racist models, et cetera, mm -hmm. that, the cat's out of the bag. Like that's 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 gone. Like it's it's out in the public open. You can you can download a model um, and have it sound mean or or biased or whatever today. And so it's not they disregard it. It's just I think it's good to have healthy debates of where is this going? What is it? How is it going to impact my children? And I do think about that. But I, I really think people need to be a little bit thoughtful and um, not assume 